Good evening. We're glad you could all come. I'm Jim Barlow. I'm events co-chairperson from Engineers Week 1979. This speech uh, is co-sponsored by uh, Committee on Lectures, generously. And uh, the speaker we're about to introduce will be one you'll find interesting. He's Robert Bazell from NBC News. He's a current science and medical correspondent for NBC television. He's kind of got an interesting history that you might like to know about. He quit high school and worked as a merchant seaman in the Pacific in 1964, earned a high school diploma, and entered the University of California, Berkeley, gr graduating 1967 with Phi Beta Kappa honors and a BA in biochemistry and a Master of Philosophy degree in biology, University of Sussex, England, in 1968. His graduate study in immunology was in the University of California, Berkeley, 1968 through 1970. In 1970 through 1972, he was a staff writer for the news and comments section of Science Magazine, the leading scientific journal in the United States. In 72 through 76, he then became a reporter and assistant city editor for the New York Post, covering everything from fires and murders to national politics. In 1976, he was a reporter in the Washington Bureau of NBC News. And then finally, in September 1978, he became science and medical correspondent at NBC News in New York. Currently, he's primarily a reporter and feature length, reporting feature length pieces for segment three, section of NBC Nightly News. Recent topics have included extensive coverage of the Three Mile and Island incident, development of robots to work on the General Motors assembly lines, and uh, a number of other issues, such as animal rights movement, heart disease research, and uh, the uh, psychology of cults, and a little bit on the implantation of electrodes into the brains of human beings. He's recently won an award in the national, from the National Press Club Award for Investigative Reporting and Television Reporting for a piece that first revealed the uh, dangers of liquid protein diet. So I'd like to introduce, without further ado, Mr. Robert Bazell. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, Jim just, I was asked when, when, when I was asked to come here to, to write a speech for engineers, to give a speech for engineers. I hope, how many of you are engineers or engineering students? Well, that's enough. <laughs> the rest of you will just have to listen. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about engineers because in, in my work for NBC News, I come in contact with, with engineers and engineering uh, and engineering plays a, a very important role in many of the stories I do. And I have a great deal of respect for the engineering uh, profession. Now, I should tell you that this wasn't always so. When I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I, I was enrolled originally in a pre-med course. And we pre-med students really looked down our noses at engineers. In fact, we, we regarded them with slightly more respect than the cats in the laboratory that, uh, that we cut up. We thought of engineers as these pimply-faced little fellows. Uh, they were all fellows in those days uh, who, who, with no interest beyond memorizing obscure equations so that someday they could get high-paying jobs. Now, you should understand that we pre-med students had no more meat on our bones than the engineers. And if you calculated the number of zits per forehead, our figure would have been just as high. And uh, instead of memorizing obscure equations, uh, we studied every detail of the digestive tracts of those dead cats on the table. And of course, when it came to future plans, pre-med students, nobody taught pre-med students in, in standing around talking about the big bucks that they were going to make someday. Yet we still look down our noses at, at the engineers. And I suppose it's because people have a tendency to want to look down their noses at somebody. Uh, the biggest problem with all this, now that I'm thinking about it years later, is that I think that engineering students often believe that propaganda. I think engineering students sometimes accept that the profession for which they're training is somehow less noble or somehow less important than science or medicine. And if those engineers, engineering students, believe that then, they were wrong. And if any of the engineers here believe it, they're wrong. Because I think that engineering is, is just as creative and just as crucial to our national well-being as either science or medicine. And if, if engineers don't believe that, they run a great risk of, of failing to fulfill their potential, both in terms of what they can accomplish for the society and, and what their contribution uh, just generally can be. 
Now, going back to my time as, as an undergraduate, I remember that of all engineering, I thought that sanitary engineering was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. I, mean, I remember going through the course catalog, and the idea that somebody would be going to college to learn how to get rid of sewage struck me abso as absolutely hilarious. But along the way, I eventually left pre-med and left a bunch of other things and ended up writing for Science Magazine. And that was a time when the environmental movement was just starting to blossom. And I had to write stories about the environment. And one of the first things I had to do was to go seek out sanitary engineers. And I had to learn a lot of sanitary engineering myself. And at that time, I learned the crucial role that these professionals play in keeping our cities alive. In fact, all engineers are crucial to this society, and I think that's true for two reasons. The first is the obvious one, that the sanitary engineers keep our rivers and lakes clean, the civil engineers build the highways, electrical engineers are developing technology that's so crucial to our competitive position in the world marketplace. All those functions that support our very existence as a nation. But the second reason is that because you engineers are the ones who implement, implement those tasks, you're the ones who have control over it. You're the ones who have control over the technology. And that's, that's the aspect of your importance that I'd like to consider this evening. It's not very common and probably not very popular for engineers to talk about the social consequences of what they do. There's an assumption that that sort of thing just isn't done. I'd like to read you a description of how engineers view their work that was written by an engineer named John Mills in the early 1940s. An engineer, he wrote, develops what his employer wants, whether the employer is government or a private corporation. He has little, little concern whether his products are utilized for general welfare or for violent destruction. To politicians, he delegates the responsibility for their use, and he rarely subjects the politicians' decisions to the same critical analysis to which he puts the data of his engineering experience, experiments. Now, I think the situation is not that different today. Most engineers simply are not worried about the use to which their work is put or the effects of it outside the immediate system in which they're working. And I think that is terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, it stems in part from the sense of inferiority that I was talking about before. Many engineers are willing to regard themselves as nothing but hired hands because they see what they do as less important than the physician treating patients or the scientists in the laboratory. They believe that somehow there's this canyon that separates engineering and applied science from, from pure science, and that isn't true. Now, we can eliminate physicians, I think, from any competition. What's happening here? Are we being attacked? Or <laughs> We can eliminate physicians from any competition with engineers because engi uh, physicians are, really are highly paid technicians, and the only difference is that their theoretical basis on which they make their decisions just isn't as strong as the ones that engineers use. And in fact, we could probably classify physicians as closer to plumbers and carpenters. But, but what about laboratory scientists? I mean, let's take, for instance, a, a biologist who's studying cancer, which sounds very dramatic and esoteric. But a biologist spends most of his time trying to solve very specific problems. It's very mundane. When you get down to the day-to-day -day work, say, for instance, and this is a, this is a typical uh, cancer research problem, a biologist might be trying to take cells from the mammary glands of mice and get them to grow in a petri dish so that he can add some liquid containing viruses to this to find out what happens. Now, to accomplish that, he has to perfect a number of steps along the way in the operation, how best to remove the tissue from the mice, and what kind of culture medium do you put it in, how, what shape should the petri dish be, and so on. And if the scientist is good, he perfects each step with the same methodology, the same rigorous methodology that an engineer would use. Now, I say if the scientist is good, because many are not, and they waste a lot of time and a lot of the taxpayers' money trying to solve these problems because they simply don't know how. And I think, in fact, that science might progress a whole lot faster if research scientists thought of themselves as engineers and were trained as engineers, rather than wizards who are trying to conjure something up out of the celestial ether. But the main point is that engineering and science are not that different. In fact, they're more alike than they are different. And when engineers behave like hired hands, delegating control of their products over to others, unnecessary harm can be brought on a lot of people. And I'd like to give you some examples of 
the behavior of some engineers that I've encountered in pieces that I've done for NBC. But before I do that, before I discuss social responsibility in engineering, I want to emphasize that neither I nor anyone else in television are, are the morally pure keepers of anyone's conscience. In fact, <laughs> we shouldn't be even talking probably, but here I am. To give, we'll give you a brief idea of the pressures in television news, I'll tell you about a programming decision that was made in Washington, D.C. about a year ago. Until that time, all three of the network television shows ran at 7 p.m. And it, it was a very competitive situation because, for obvious reasons, there's enormous interest in the national news in Washington. Then NBC decided to try to do something about that, and it put its network show on at 6.30, a half hour earlier. And at 7 o'clock, NBC, my network, ran the newlywed game. Now, I don't know how many of you ever watched the newlywed game. I wouldn't embarrass you by asking. But I think it's one of the most despicable things that has ever been put before the public. People humiliating themselves, all sorts of sexual innuendo that uh, is improper. Well, the punchline to this story is that at 7 o'clock, the newlywed game beat out both Walter Cronkite and ABC News by a lot in Washington, D.C., and it still does. And that situation shows you that the pressures that shows the pressures that there are to put junk on the air instead of responsible programming. And so that because of this constant pressure to make money, I don't and I don't think that television has and I don't think television has done anything like a good job of, of resisting it. So because of it, I think television has its problems too. In fact, television is just another form of technology, another form of engineering uh, that has the potential to do enormous good, a potential to inform and enlighten people around the world on one hand. On the other hand, it could become the most powerful instrument of propaganda in the hands of a dictator that anyone has ever known. That hasn't happened yet, but the possibility is there. And in between those two extremes, we have Laverne and Shirley. So I, don't, I want to save uh, any more talk about television to some discussion that we might have at the end, because I'd, I'd like to hear how you folks feel about what I'm saying. And, and so we'll I'll leave some room for, for questions at the end if, if you people want to do it. But with the knowledge that we are not doing our job as well as we could either, I want to go on and give you these examples of of stories of some engineers that I've encountered. And the first example is Three Mile Island, because Three Mile Island was traumatic, not just for the nuclear industry, but for the media who covered the story as well. During the first 24 hours, after it was reported that there was some leak of radioactivity from that plant, the men from the Metropolitan Edison Company, the company that owned the plant, uh, and who were, by the way, either en most of whom were either engineers, company engineers, or they were management people who had been trained as engineers. They stood there and they told us with a straight face that there was nothing to worry about, no problems. And not only did we in the media believe them, the governor of Pennsylvania believed them, officials of local officials in Harrisburg and Middletown believed them, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission believed them, and most of important, because of all those folks believing them, the residents of central Pennsylvania thought there was nothing to worry about. Well, we now know that the company officials were standing there lying through their teeth. Uh, their word was as good as the Vietnam generals describing the light at the end of the tunnel or Nixon administration officials saying that there was no cover-up. In a lot of ways, it was worse because of the, the potential hazard. We recently learned, in fact, this came out at a committee hearing in Washington yesterday that while they were standing there telling us, reassuring us that everything was all right, the temperatures in the core of the reactor were 3,700 degrees, and on the hot leg of the steam generator, they were 750 degrees. And if there are any nuclear engineers here, you know that that means that the thing was about to melt, or in fact, that it started to melt. It means that a major disaster was just about to occur, something the likes of which we'd never seen. And then there was a question of the hydrogen bubble that was stuck up there in the cooling system. Uh, the, the bubble was formed because the, the uh, material had gotten so hot that when they finally did get a little bit of water in, it, it uh, electrolyzed, which means that it, the water became gas and there was hydrogen and oxygen in there. 
And that not only stuck up the cooling system, so the cooling system couldn't work, but more importantly, a lot of people thought that the bubble was going to explode. And in, in the last few months, the nuclear industry has issued a lot of statements saying that, uh, well, there never really was any danger of explosion from that bubble. And I think that's probably true, because it turns out that the oxygen was recombined with the hydrogen into water, and there, there, there was no oxygen in there which, to combine with it to explode. But the fact was that at that time, the top nuclear engineers in this country, the top minds, didn't, didn't think there was no problem. In fact, they were damn scared that it was going to blow up. And in, a little bit of hydrogen gas, by the way, had gotten into the containment vessel on day two, and, and there was an explosion, but it was outside the actual reactor. So, so they were lying. They were lying about the perceived danger. And the result of those lies was that for the first few days, the crucial hours after that accident, none of us in the media, nor the government officials, nor the people on the street uh, were getting the truth. And after we realized we weren't getting the truth, none of us were prepared to believe anybody from the company. And it was a little while before we were prepared to believe anybody from the government, because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission didn't behave in, in such a wonderful way in this either. And so the panic panic, and I don't use that word lightly, began to rise. It was a sort of panic that you can only feel when you know there's a tremendous danger, but you don't know how great the danger is. Uh, on Friday afternoon, two days after the accident, a low-level official from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said that he didn't believe that the possibility of a core meltdown was too great. That was the first time that anybody had said that there was a possibility of a core meltdown. A core meltdown, by the way, is the China syndrome. I, if I'm talking to a non, it, it would mean that the reactor would melt and a, about the same amount of radiation would have been released from that plant as, as occurred in Hiroshima. There wouldn't have been an explosion, but there would have been that much radiation. I think that if the those engineers from Metropolitan Edison had told the truth in the first place. That statement at that time would have been taken in context. We would have known that there was a problem. Steps would have been taken. We would have understood what was happening. But in fact, since we heard it then for the first time, things just went crazy. Uh, that afternoon, a, a friend of mine who was, who was a newspaper reporter, this is just to give you an idea of what it was like in Harrisburg then, he was driving around in downtown Harrisburg, and the radio was blaring all these uh, horror stories about what was happening. And one minute they were saying evacuate, the next minute they said, no, wait, don't evacuate. And he, this guy needed gas for his car, and he pulled into a gas station, and the gas station attendants were huddled inside their little house there. They were afraid to come out and, and give him gas. They, they were even afraid to run to their cars to get out of town. They didn't know what to do. And that, that evening, there was an NBC camera crew and a correspondent and a producer who were standing in it. They were in a Winnebago at the plant gate. And a Pennsylvania state trooper who had been inside the plant came running out, screaming hysterically that the whole thing was about to blow up. And that correspondent, who is a very experienced professional man, got on the phone to uh, the headquarters that we had in Harrisburg. And he said that everybody should get out and don't worry about him and the, the others because they were going to be dead anyway. And, well, I don't know if that gives you an impression of what it was like to make decisions at that time about what should go on the air, but I think you get a sense that maybe it was difficult. Uh, on the one hand, we all had a des desire not to needlessly alarm anyone, but on the other hand, we had been lied to so thoroughly that we didn't want uh, to not let people know if there was, in fact, a real danger. And, in, and on top of that, at the same time, there were all sorts of problems about personal safety, whether or not uh, if we went in a certain area to take pictures or interview people, whether there was a danger to ours or future generations. We just didn't know that. We had, by that time, we had managed to get radiation counters, but as you probably know, radiation counters, you have to take them in to be counted, and by that time, you've already been exposed, so it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Uh, so, but I want to repeat that I think the whole thing 
would have been much better if there hadn't been the lies. And, and there would have been much less damage in the long run to nuclear industry as a cause or to, the, or to nuclear power as a cause or to the nuclear industry. I mean, I can give you an example. The day before yesterday, I covered the incident at Prairie Island, which is near just south of Minneapolis. It wasn't a very serious accident. A, a tiny amount of radiation was released, which is not supposed to happen. No radiation is ever supposed to be released. But it was so small that it really was not a threat to the public health. The reactor, as soon as the pipe broke that caused that, the reactor scrammed. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was advised immediately. In fact, there was an inspector in the plant at the time. And there was never any danger to anyone. And yet, the, the governor of Minnesota was not about to say that it was all safe at, for at least 12 hours, or it was more, after the company said it was safe. People were damn scared. We didn't want to, you know, we considered it a much bigger story than we would have considered it if it hadn't been for Three Mile Island. So for now, I want to leave you just with the impression of those engineers who stood there and lied. And I want to go on to a second ex example, which was a piece I did about a year and a half ago about a smelter in Denver that processes a, a metal called cadmium. Now, if there are any chemical engineers here, you, you know that smelting is a dirty business. It, it's where metal is purified. In, in big open vats with fire coming out and all sorts of things. And a lot of fumes are given off, and the fumes can cause health problems. This particular smelter is owned by a company called Asarco, which is a large multinational that runs uh, smelters around the world. And Asarco has a reputation in the industry as a black hat, which means that it strongly resists any attempts at, at government regulation. Uh, you might remember there were news stories. Asarco has a lead smelter in El Paso, Texas, that was blowing poisonous fumes across the border into Juarez. And Mexican children were suffering the symptoms of lead poisoning. And the, they, the same company had a plant in Tacoma, Washington, where they were cited for exposing their workers to excess arsenic, which was giving many of them lung, can lung cancer. But despite those abuses by Asarco, the plant in Denver was the worst. And it was the worst case of occupational disease that I've ever seen. And there were some government occupational health scientists who had been in there. And they told me that it was the worst case that they had ever seen. Every man who worked in that plant was sick and dying. They had arthritis, lung conditions. Some had cancer. And it was just a matter of time before they, they, were all, they all die. Uh, the plant had been repeatedly cited by authorities for excessive poisonous fumes and other violations. But the company was spending, I think is spending, the situation hasn't ended, hundreds of thousands of dollars to resist the, the effort to clean up. And there were men who worked for that company, engineers, who testified before the, the government bodies that were trying to get the company to, to clean up. That they testified that there really wasn't any problem. And besides, even if there is a problem, there's nothing that we can do about it. Now, all those people had to do was take a walk around the plant to read the reports that had been written about that plant or to talk to some of the workers. And they would have realized, and I'm sure they knew, that's, that something is terribly, terribly wrong there. And those are the engineers that I want to leave you with from that story. The third incident concerns a, a piece that I just finished. It hasn't been on the air yet that concerns a dam that it broke. Uh, engineers say that the dam failed. Somehow it doesn't sound as bad. Uh, this was a, a relatively small dam uh, in near a, a place called Church Rock, New Mexico. But this dam served a very important function. It held back the tailings from a uranium mill. And when the dam broke, 100 million gallons of water containing uh, low-level radioactivity and poisonous heavy metals went spilling into a river called the Rio Puerco. Now, the river is a large, is the, excuse me, the river is the only source of water for a large group of Navajo Indians and for their livestock. And after the, the break, the New Mexico State Health Department told the Indians that they could, could not slaughter their sheep nor sell their sheep. And their sheep are their only source of livelihood because the sheep had drunk from the river and they could be contaminated. There were also several children who had been playing in or near the river, and they were taken to Los Alamos to be counted for radiation, and no one is sure yet whether they suffered any damage. So the thing caused a lot of hardship. 
Now, the company that owns that dam, it turns out, had a good reason to suspect that it might break. They had hired a, a large engineering consulting firm, Kaiser Engineering, from California. And Kaiser had advised them that they needed to put a layer of sand up against the dirt. It was a dirt dam because this material that they were holding back was, was very acidic and it was corroding through the uh, dirt. And the company engineers chose to ignore that advice. They also chose to ignore a warning when the dam started to have some leaks in it. And they decided to just sort of plug the leaks up instead of trying to rebuild the dam. And they just hoped for the best, and the best didn't happen. And those are, the, those are the men I want to leave you with from that story. So here we have three situations in which engineers either failed to recognize the social consequences of what they were doing, or they simply ignored them. Now, why would engineers, trained people in an honorable profession, do that? Well, I think the best answer is greed. Uh, usually, it's corporate greed the desire of a company to make money no matter who gets hurt or killed. And, when, and corporate greed, I think, translates into individual greed when somebody says, I'll take my paycheck and do whatever the company tells me to do, and I'll let the company worry about the consequences. You know, greed means trying to keep the reactor going, even if it looks like it might blow, and not warning the public because we don't want anybody bothering us. It means not properly rebuilding the dam, trying to wing it. And it means not concerning yourself with workers who are dying from toxic fumes because it costs too much to clean up the plant. But I don't think greed is the only answer to why we have situations like this. Greed is, greed is so common that there's really not much else to say about it. But another factor, excuse me, another factor is the quality of the engineers who enter certain professions. And I, for those of you who are looking for jobs, I think this is very important. It's really true for the utility executives who are responsible for nuclear power plants. I think if you talk to the faculty members around here who are responsible for placement and engineering, you'd find out that over the last many years, few decades, the brightest graduates of engineering schools have not gone to work for electrical utilities. Electrical utilities have been seen as rather dull, mundane jobs. I mean, you just put the electricity through the wires and light people's light bulbs. But it turns out that in those same few years, electrical utilities have come to control nuclear power plants, which is the most complicated, potentially dangerous civilian technology there is. And so you have these real dummies who've worked their way up the corporate ladder, starting out as engineers who become, uh, who've become responsible for nuclear power plants. And particularly for small utilities like Metropolitan Edison, it's a real problem. And they'll even, even the younger company people will even say that, not, not on the record, but it's, it's, not a, it's, it's a gigantic problem. And I think the lesson in that is that for you engineers who are seeking jobs, you, you shouldn't underestimate the potential importance of a job, even if it seems fairly dull at first glance. And aside from the quality and competence of the people involved and their, and their greed, there, there are other problems endemic to the engineering profession that can lead to irresponsible actions. One of these is overconfidence in the technology with which you're working. It's very easy to delude yourself into thinking that you know more than you do and that you're able to accomplish and control factors which, in fact, you can't control. It's a basic tendency, I think, of human nature to believe that when you finally got something to work, it, there couldn't possibly be anything wrong with it. Or, or that when you've done something, it, it couldn't possibly do, do any harm. I think one of the best illustrations of this I, I can think of is, is the last scene in the film Bridge on the River Kwai. I don't know if it's an old film, and it's still shown on TV every once in a while. But I think it, it contains a marvelous metaphor for engineers. It's a story about a group of British prisoners of war who are forced by their Japanese captors to build a bridge on the River Kwai for, on, for the Burma Railroad. And they finally complete the bridge, and they do a very good job of it. And it, it but the cost to them is enormous misery. Many of them die uh, and, and suffer in, in doing it. 
And finally, near the end of the film, these prisoners of war are liberated by a group of British commandos, and the commandos go on to blow up the bridge. And just as they're about to blow up the bridge, one of the men who built it, in fact, sort of the head engineer, goes out and tries to stop them. I mean, he built this bridge. He didn't want to see it destroyed. And, and we see the same thing constantly in engineering. It's my nuclear reactor. I built it. It couldn't possibly go wrong. Or it's my dam. It's not going to break. And I think that sort of complacency was one of the factors in the, in the dam failure that I just described. And it was certainly a major reason why the Teton Dam in Idaho failed. Like, what is it, about a, a couple of years ago now? And a congressional committee concluded that the main problem was, was overconfidence of engineers. And I, that sort of overconfidence is particularly a problem if you've been performing a task successfully for a long period. When you've made a lot of dams and none of those dams are broken, so how could this one possibly break? Another thing is that most engineers like their work. They, they want to accomplish tasks. And I, th that's another source of difficulty. Often engineers, either consciously or unconsciously, disregard hazards because they want to push ahead toward the goal. And the best example of that is the Army Corps of Engineers, which has many marvelous accomplishments to its credit, but which also has built a whole lot of turkeys simply because it wants to build them. And often the Corps' desire to get a project completed far outweighs any consideration of whether the project is needed or whether it's dangerous. Of course, it, it, it's not always easy to know that a particular feat of engineering is dangerous or how it might be dangerous. There are all sorts of well, examples of well-intentioned work that, that ultimately proved to be very bad. The x-rays, for example, I mean, as late as the 1950s, there was no realization of, of the cancer hazard from x-rays. And even today, the debate continues over the effects of low-level radiation. And, a lot of people will say they just still just don't know uh, whether even dental x-rays can present a serious problem. Another thing is that engineers are often overconfident of their abilities to accomplish tasks uh, without danger because they don't consider entire systems. Now, the ecology movement made that a little bit better. I think there's, it's more fashionable nowadays to, to consider entire systems. But despite all that, I think the biggest source of problems is the attitude, the one that I described in that paragraph that I read before. And that is that engineers think that they have no reason to be concerned about the consequences of what they do. It's, it's like that old song, uh, I think it was Tom Paxton, about Werner von Braun. He made the rockets go up, but where, excuse, where they come down is somebody else's problem. And the idea that engineers are, are automatons, that you plug in the question in one end, and the solution comes out the other end. Well, it might seem crazy, or it might say it's none of my damn business, but, but I think that engineers should be concerned about the fallout from their work. And we have plenty of examples of what happens when there is concern. And I, they're cliches. You've heard them all before. We have smog in the air from automobiles, chemical waste in the public waterways, traffic deaths on poorly designed highways, and so on. And I haven't even mentioned military work up to now. If I think that if you sincerely believe, as an engineer, that weapons development is necessary for our national defense, and if you can look at yourself in the mirror and say that what you're doing contributes to that goal, I don't think very many people could have a problem with that, because at least you're being honest. But I think about the chemical engineers who work for Dow who made not only napalm, but napalm B, which was even better, they thought, because it stuck more quickly to the human flesh. The burning gel stuck, stuck more strongly to the human flesh. And they would sit in their laboratories and make that stuff. And what, what could it have been like for those men to go home and see the pictures of the burning Vietnamese peasants? I, I don't understand that. And one of the excuses that engineers 
and others will offer to themselves is that even if the project that they're working on has some bad consequences, they are too far down the line. Their job is too insignificant to matter. Well, I think that you engineers should remember that if somebody is paying you to do the job, it's not insignificant. And I don't think the exhibitors that came here for Engineers Week paid all that money to try to lure you to work for their company because they think that what you're going to do is insignificant. And you as students are spending years of your life here. You're eating up thousands of dollars of, of your money, your parents, and the taxpayers' money. And in the process, even, even the dimmest among you is going to acquire very valuable skills. And I think you should also be careful about concluding that a project, a certain project, holds no danger or no social impact. In fact, I would maintain that very, very few engineering projects have no social impact. Because like I said before, engineering is one of the crucial underpinnings of this society. And it's not just dams that might break or chemicals that might pollute or bombs that might go off. Say you're working on a computer project. Is there any possibility for invasion of privacy? Is, is this computer going to put people out of work? What if you're working for some company and you build new or you synthesize new detergent additive XY63K that uh, they're going to be able to say is going to make everybody's clothes whiter and in fact, of course, it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with it. I mean, is that a consequence that you should be concerned with? What about designing gadgets that are going to be sold to people who don't really need them? I think that there's something to think about in all that. Now, what if you are working on a project and you're worried about the consequences of it? And what should you do? Well, I'm not suggesting that you immediately contact your local newspaper or even local television station, but I'd be happy to hear from any of you, <laughs> particularly those of you who are going to nuclear or oil, work for an oil company. I'll pass out my cards before. Uh, but I think, first of all, it would be a giant step if you were to just think about, think about these issues. And I realize that it's much easier for me to stand here and say that than it is for you to do it. As I said, consequences are not that readily apparent. The sort of analysis is very, very difficult. It's much more difficult than the kind of problem solving that you're taught to do in engineering school. And I think, in fact, it's a major fault of this and other engineering schools that people aren't taught how to analyze the social consequences of what they're doing. The, but, and one difficulty, well, but it, well, it is difficult. But the second thing is, and perhaps one way that you can start thinking about it, is to listen to the critics of your profession. It's very, very easy. One particularly, you know, it's not, not so easy when you're a student, but it's much easier when, you, when you're off, have an actual engineering job. It's very easy to dismiss the critics. It's very easy to call the anti-nuclear demonstrators kooks who don't really understand the intricacies of the safety system. It's very easy to, to criticize environmentalists who, who you might say are alarmists, who, who have nothing, uh, nothing but negative things to say about anything and are against progress. But oftentimes, these people do understand. And they do see where engineers have blind spots. One example was the anti-nuclear uh, activists of the, of the 1960s. And at, at that time, those people were many fewer than, than Jane Fonda and her friends are now. Uh, and the, the leaders of that movement, the professors Goffman and Tamplin, who were nuclear scientists, but they, they were the, the main spokesmen, they were severely ridiculed. I mean, I remember hearing top, their, their former colleagues, call them fools, demented, senile. And yet because of what they said, the emphasis in the 1960s switched in, in the nuclear business to being more concerned with safety than almost anything else. And if that hadn't happened, we might have actually had a meltdown by now and not, all, and not an almost meltdown. And if we look at the reactors in the Soviet Union, that's an interesting example because there's not the free flow of ideas there. There's obviously, there's not the criticism. And reactors in the Soviet Union 
don't even have, or at least until recently, I think a few of them, but they don't even have containment facilities. And they have less than half of the safety backup systems that American reactors have. So I don't think that the kind of criticism that you hear is, is always a bad thing. You, know, you don't have to agree with it, but I'm just saying you should listen to it and make sure that they're not saying something that you should hear. And I'm not saying that if, if a project poses a potential danger or harmful effect, it should be canceled or, or engineers shouldn't work on it or something like that. Well, industry faced with environmental opposition is very fond of saying that there is a hazard in everything we do. And in fact, that's true. And, but people who live underneath a dam and understand that there is some danger from that dam, and that that dam might fail, still might want the dam built because of the benefits. But the point is that in a democracy, it's the people who should decide whether or not the dam gets built, not a bunch of engineers and managers. And the American public is quite able to assimilate information. And I think that when an engineer says that the public can't understand the intricacies of what he's designing, can't understand the possible consequences, he's being an arrogant fool. Because the public can very easily understand, and, can, and the public should make the choices. Because if you don't believe that the public should, should make the choices, you don't believe in democracy. And it, but it, that sounds silly, maybe. But in fact, that is the, the consequence, often, of the behavior of, of engineers and technicians who refuse to share the information that they have about possible hazards. I don't think there would ever be a question of a lack of social responsibility on the part of an engineer working on a project where the public understands the risks and benefits and is willing to accept them. So to get back to the question, what, what should you do if you think, if you're working on, on a project and you think something is wrong, you think there's a danger that the public doesn't know about? Well, I think you should make some noise, privately at first. Talk to, talk to other people, talk to your fellow workers, and then to your superiors. And then possibly if you're convinced that nothing is happening, then maybe you should go public through the media or whatever. And there are enormous risks involved in that. The chance of, of losing your job or subjecting yourself to ridicule or humiliation. And there are examples of it all the time. I mean, anyone who stands up in the corporate structure and says that this project shouldn't be built, or this project, the people don't understand what the hazards are from this project, is subjecting himself or herself to a very severe punishment. But uh, it takes a lot of guts to do things right, and there's a lot of forces working in the other direction. I, th I think that engineers should remember that engineering is an honorable profession. I mean, far from being amoral and, and coldly logical, I think engineering by itself generates values, and these include intellectual humility and, and an unusually acute regard for honesty that you see in very few other, other professions. I mean, in that narrow system where engineers work, you really have to consider the truth, the facts. And I think there's, there's a clear sense of purpose in engineering, and there's, there's an emphasis on cooperation that, that exists in very few other places. But too often, these values are exercised with regard to the particular problem that an engineer is working on, and not with regard to the engineer's place in the society. Uh, I just I want to read something here. This was a, an engineer named Dr. Meredith Thring, who's a professor at Queen Mary College in London, wrote an article in 1971 in The New Scientist. And he suggested that young engineers, students, should be required to take an oath that was analogous to the physician's Hippocratic oath. And he thought that you should take it at, your, at the stage in which your students are. And I, I want to read this. So I vow to strive to apply my professional skill only to projects which, after conscientious examination, I believe to contribute to the goal of coexistence of all human beings in peace, human dignity, and self-fulfillment. I believe that this goal requires the provision of an adequate supply of the necessities of life, good food, air, water, and man-made beauty, access to, to natural and man-made beauty, 
education and opportunities to enable each person to work out for himself his life objectives and to develop creativeness and skill in the use of hands as well as heads. I vow to struggle through my work to minimize danger, noise, strain, or invasion of privacy to the individual, pollution of earth, air, or water, destruction of natural beauty, mineral resources, and wildlife. Now, I don't know how you engineers would feel about that kind of vow, but I, I just want to end this by saying that I think that you should take some kind of vow and that you should think about what you're doing. That's all I want. I just would like now to to hear some questions or any comments on, on, on any of that. Thank you.